a while toward to get to the end, uh, but uh, I, I love this chapter. Uh, it is one of the greatest doctrinal chapters and in-depth chapters you'll find. Uh, maybe the most difficult chapter because there's so many different opinions uh, and struggles over who's right and who's wrong, and I don't get into too much of that. I just have to take it at face value and what the Holy Spirit leads me to interpret it. Uh, but in verse 35, Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can all say praise God, hallelujah, right there, amen. Uh, Paul had faced several enemies, uh, of the, several of the, uh, of the seven enemies that uh, he names in verse 35. If you go back and study his life, and most of us also have faced those same enemies if you've served the Lord any time at all. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, all those things Paul had experienced somewhere uh, in his walk with God, uh, in his journey. If you look to verse 30, he says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So there's some things that Paul went through uh, so that God could get the glory. And there's things you're going to be through, and there's things you're going to go through so God can get the glory out of your life. And by the way, that's why you're here. You're here so you can be a display of grace. If you read the book of Ephesians, God is doing, presenting you as a display of grace to those around you. Uh, we are His workmanship. Paul says in Ephesians, he's working in and through our lives. He, like a chain or like a, a spoke in a bicycle, uh, he's orchestrating those things together uh, to, for an accumulative effort to bring us to where we need to be with God, but also to bring others with us. Now, he comes to the conclusion that nothing or no one can separate us from the love of God, amen, or love of Christ. And praise the Lord for that. Well, as you journey back for just a moment, there's three basic things we've already seen. Uh, first of all, in this entire chapter, uh, we see our failure, uh, our failure to keep the law. Uh, we cannot, we cannot keep the law, uh, and he stresses that in chapter eight. We see the struggle we have with the flesh, uh, and none of those things. Listen, uh, none of those things can uh, survive within us. The flesh. Uh, we see the sufferings and the struggles of life. They cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Our failure to keep the law cannot separate us from the love of Christ. The struggle we have with the flesh can't separate us from the love of Christ. The sufferings and struggles of life can't separate us from the love of Christ. Aren't you glad for that? Well, first of all, we see Paul's settled persuasion there in verse 38. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. What's he saying? Notice he says in this text, he says back in verse 37, nay or no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He's going back to these persecutions, these, the distress, the tribulation, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, the sword, all those mul the mul multiple things he's mentioned here, that's what he's referring to. And he, is, he has a settled persuasion here. Uh, he says in all these things, none of these things, listen, he says none of these things has, has the power to sever our soul from Jesus Christ. Just one more great evidence of eternal security. None of these things have the power to sever our soul from Jesus Christ. Once you become a Christian, you're always a Christian. Amen. Verse 28, Paul says this. As you really, as you interpret verse 28, uh, he says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, uh, to them that are called according to His purpose. Now, in verse 28, Paul is literally saying this. He says, I have, be I, I have become and remain convinced. He said, I am certain. I have come through a process of, 
of persuasion. I have come to a settled conclusion. And he reinforces that in verse 38. He says, I am persuaded. And that's what he's saying here. He has come to a a about face conclusion. He says, I have become and remain convinced. I've come to a settled conclusion that all things work together for good to those who love God and called according to His purpose. He says, and I'm also persuaded that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. That's what he's saying. That it was His settled persuasion. Let me just say, the sooner you come to that settled persuasion in your heart and your life, the better off you're going to be too. Well, look at Paul's subtle observation. Paul mentions nine items here uh, in verse uh, 38 and verse 39. Really four pairs and one single uh, word uh, that could possibly create a barrier in our fellowship with God. First of all, look at verse 38. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life. So there's the first one. He says, uh, not the crisis of death nor the calamities of life can separate us from the love of Christ. So as you look into the text there in verse 38, that's simply what he's saying. He says, not the crisis of death nor the calamities of life can separate us from the love of Christ. I love 2 Timothy 1, verse 9 and 10. He says, who hath, speaking of Jesus, Paul says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now listen. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Secondly, we find that he mentions not the intervention of angels nor the uh, intervention of demons. He, he says in verse, uh, he says, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about, he says, not the intervention of angels nor the intervention of demons. Uh, Whether good or bad, angels we find are powerless to do anything to remove us from the love of God. That's what he's saying. Whether it's good angels, whether it's demonic angels, neither one of them have the power to remove us, listen, to remove us from the love of God. And by the way, Christ reigns over uh, all angels of heaven and all principalities and powers are powerless to do anything to remove us from the love of God. Listen to book Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 22. He says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ. Listen. When He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church. Amen. Folks, Paul wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of death. Uh, as he writes here, he says in verse 30, I'm persuaded nor principalities nor powers, uh, neither life nor death. He's not afraid of death. Uh, he said, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, he says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you remember what he used, you've heard it many times at a funeral. He said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, not only was death, listen, unable to separate him from Christ, life was also unable to do so as well. And that's what he says in that text. Life wasn't able to separate him either. You know, there are a lot of countless things in our lives as we sit here tonight that really honestly have the potential to pull us away from Christ. Think about it for just a moment. Disappointments. Some of you have already been disappointed this week. You'll be disappointed tomorrow. You might be disappointed by the next day. Failures. Uncertainties. Bitterness, physical and emotional miseries, and we can go on and on. All of these things have the potential to pull us away if it weren't for the grace and the love of God. Amen? 
And that's what Paul's getting at. None of these things, listen, uh, they, they, the potential is lost because of, of Christ's love for us and our love for Him. And He gives us a, an ability to overcome all these things He's mentioned here. Every one of these things could pull us away if it weren't for the grace and love of God. Listen to what Paul said in a couple of passages here. He said, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. He said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Philippians 1.23, he said, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. And then he said in Colossians, and you being dead in your sins and, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then he also said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, verse 22, and he's speaking, uh, he says, and, and that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept His authority. That's what he's saying. Thirdly, he says, Not the cares for today, nor the concerns of tomorrow. Uh, he says, Things present in verse 38, nor things to come. That's what he's saying. Jesus said in John 16, 33, He said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me here on earth. He says, you're going to have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, John says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. He says, Not the cares for today, nor the concerns of tomorrow. Uh, those things, listen, they, they can't take... They can't take the love of God from us. Lastly, he says, Not the afflictions from heaven nor the advances from hell can take away the love of God from us. Uh, as he writes in verse 39, he says, Nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate from the love of God. As, as he uses this term height or depth or any other creature, uh, he's talking about the advances from hell. He's talking about things that afflict us in life. And, and Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8, he says, I can, uh, the psalmist said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, he says, you're there. That's what Paul said. Paul said the exact same thing. He says, thank God, I can't escape your love. No matter what comes my way. He says, listen, whether it's the, the, the height, depth, or any other creature, you can't take away the love of God. And then he says, lastly, that no created thing, no created thing, he says, nor any creature, no created thing can take away the love of God or God's love from us. John Stott wrote this about this portion of Scripture so far, I quote. He said, nothing seems stable in our world any longer. Insecurities written across all human experience. Christian people are not guaranteed immunity to temptation, tribulation, or tragedy, but we're promised victory over them. God's pledge is not that suffering will never afflict us, but that, we'll ne but that it will never separate us from His love. Amen. Amen. His love never changes, folks. And the Satan wants us to, listen, he wants us to uh, get the poot's mouth with God if something don't go right or something we don't understand or a catastrophe or disaster or something comes to our lives. Uh, he, he works in those modes and he pulls, Satan tries to use those strongholds to, to cause us to think that God doesn't love us or this wouldn't be happening to us. And Paul's refuting that. He says there's nothing, no creature, nothing to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there we come to the victorious conclusion there in the latter part of verse 39. He said, listen, he says, there's nothing that shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing or no one that can separate us from God's love. We might grow weary, 
We might get injured. We might fall down. Uh, we might even quit somewhere along the way on God. But listen, but that will never change God's love for us. We can all be grateful for that, can't we? Why? Because it goes back to that verse. He says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not on our own, not through our religion, uh, not through our membership, not through our baptism, not through our uh, identity. Uh, he says, we, listen, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's through him, through nothing else or no one else. It's through him. He, and that little word conquers, more than conquers, gives us the idea of being super conquerors. In other words, it really means super, super conquerors. In other words, with His help and with His grace and His hand upon our life, we can face anything and we can overcome anything because He's on our side. There's nothing or no one to keep us from being champions for Christ. And that's what He's basically saying as we close that out. Well... Really what Paul's done here in this whole chapter, uh, if you're taking notes, it's not on your sheet that I gave you. In, in verse 35, verse 36, he's really given us a statement of Christian confidence. In my soul, how we need confidence today as men and women of God in the day in which we live. A, a statement of Christian confidence. There's so many Christians today defeated and discouraged and, and, and because of all the scenarios and situations around us. Then in verse 37, he gives us the source of, of Christian confidence. Uh, the source is the fact that it's through Him that loved us. There's our source. And then we see the steadfastness of Christian confidence in verse 38 and verse 39. And it's still Jesus Christ. And it's that persuasion. Well, let me come to conclusion, conclusion give you a, a, just a, a brief outline that this is on the, this sums up the whole chapter with four general statements, okay? looking at everything we've already talked about. And uh, I'll, Jamie's going to put on the screen, you can jot them down. But first of all, we're free from the judgment of sin. That, the first 10 verses, verses 1 through verse 10, Paul is, is saying this in a nutshell. We're free from judgment because Christ died for us and we have His righteousness. That's the first statement that he makes in this first 10 verses. We are free. Notice every, every phrase I'm going to give you has the word free in it, okay? We're free. We're, we find something, in other words, in Jesus that the law could not provide. The law could never bring real freedom. But Jesus Christ gave us freedom. We're free through Jesus. He says we're free from judgment because Christ died for us and we have His righteousness. In other words... We've been declared not guilty through Jesus Christ. We've been justified, and He's made us righteous. He's made us right with Him. Secondly, in verse 11 through verse 17, we're free from defeat because Christ lives in us by His Spirit, and we share His life. <laughs> Don't miss that. Hey, we're free from defeat because Christ is... <laughs> we're free from defeat because Christ lives in us. So the next time you get defeated and discouraged and down and out, just, hey, stop and think about it. Hey, just wait. Stop for a minute and say, hey, I'm going to remind myself that Jesus lives in me and He's not discouraged and He's not defeated. And praise God, I can go on because He lives in me and through me. We're free from defeat because Christ lives in us by His Spirit. And listen, and we share His life. Hey, when you get saved, He moves in. The third part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit moves in you and He lives in and through you and you share your life with Him. If you're saved, that's what you're doing. You're daily sharing your life with Him and He's sharing His life with you through the pages of God's Word. Number three, in verse 18 through verse 27. We're free from discouragement because Christ is coming for us. 
and we shall share his glory. I don't know about you, but that just gets me excited right there. I'm glad he's coming for me. I'm, not, I'm glad he's not going to live me in this world that's filled with hell, amen, and sin and death and agony and pain. I'm glad I'm going somewhere where there's no more death, there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain, there's no more gossip and slander and ridicule and jealousy and envy and strife, amen. Praise God. We're free from discouragement because He's coming for us and we're going to share His glory. <laughs> Can you just imagine being like Jesus? We ought to be working on it just a little bit now, every day. But you see, we won't have to work at it when we're in His presence. We're going to be in a glorified state, a glorified body. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more difficulty, and none of those other things I mentioned. Number four, in verse 28 through verse 39, which we've just finished the last couple weeks, we're free from fear because Christ intercedes for us and we can't be separated from His love. Amen? Praise God. He's, listen, He doesn't want you to fail. He's interceding for you right now to the Father. He's praying that you achieve and, you, and you're successful as a Christian. He's praying that you have the, a, a, a deep love relationship with Him. He's praying that you'll remain in fellowship with Him. He doesn't want you to wander off. He wants the best for you. We're not talking about that name it, claim it stuff and prosperity religion. That's not what we're talking about. Listen, he's got a lot invested in you. He's got his darling son that he nailed to a rugged cross for you. And he has his son invested in you. And listen, we're free from fear because he's praying for us. He's interceding for us so that we would not fail, so that we won't sin. And we can't be separated from his love. And you've heard me make the statement so many times. Sunday school wall. It says God loves you whether you like it or not. And that pretty well sums it up. There are times I'm sure he's not pleased with some of the things we do. I did say we because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God and we all fail him. But you can bank on one fact based on Romans chapter 8. There's no way, no way, never, ever, ever, no way you can be separated from His love. Amen? Even the worst person out here on the street right now doing the most heinous things, He doesn't love what they're doing, but He loves them so much. He sent His Son, His darling Son, to die on a cross for their sin. And He did the same thing for you because you were guilty of sin. And that sums up Romans chapter 8. Thank God there's nothing shall be able to separate from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, listen, when you get Jesus, when you take Jesus, you get it all. When you take Jesus, you get the Father. When you take Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. You get, the, you get the, all three parts of the Godhead working in and through your life. You have a force living within you a person that cannot be reckoned with. And nobody can strip you of his love. Amen. Thank God. Thank God for the love of Jesus. And knowing that, knowing that, listen, knowing that, we ought to live steadfast lives. That's what that word persuaded means. It, it, the word persuaded means to, it means to live in a state of, of, of steadfastness. We ought to be steadfast in Christian confidence. Let me challenge you when you leave here tonight, don't be discouraged, don't be defeated. Let me challenge next time you come to the house of God, just remember who you are. Come ready, uh, anticipating Him to work in and through your lives, and let the Holy Spirit flow through you and give Him honor and praise and glory for what He's done and what He's doing in your life. Amen? Amen. Well, that's the message tonight. Good stuff, good stuff. I, I hate to leave that chapter. There's so much in there, uh, but it's powerful, powerful, good stuff. Well, let's all stand tonight. Here's the real question. As we stand, our, Danny, if you'll come. Paul said, as we bow our head and close our eyes, in verse 28, he says, I have become and remain convinced. That's what he meant when he talked about being persuaded.
in verse 38. I have become and remain convinced. I am certain. He said, I have come through a process of persuasion and I've come to a settled conclusion. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I don't know what you're going through tonight and what you may be struggling with. Maybe you come tonight and you feel like God doesn't love you or you wouldn't be going through this or going through that. Sometimes it's because we're going through, through this or that's because He does love us. Because He's trying to work out something in our lives for, his, for, his, for your good and His glory. Maybe there's something or someone you need to come lay on this altar tonight and come to a settled conclusion and leave here convinced that God loves you and He has your life at best interest. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the truths found this precious passage of scripture speak to our hearts now in division and collectively lord as we give this invitation may we reach that place of persuasion tonight may we be convinced of the love of christ no matter where we're at and what we're going through may we be grateful for your love in jesus name amen